Thank you for inviting me back to Vilnius. Uh, the title of the presentation is on targeting house prices. Uh, the word target here is important. I think everyone understands we should look at house prices. Uh, we should worry about house prices when they're rising. I think that's all, and we should respond when they're rising too fast. I think that's now a no-brainer. The question is, should we target them? Uh, I should also say I'll, I will keep using the word we. Uh, that may seem odd when you can see I work uh, for the financial sector. I'm not here to play the pantomime villain and tell you you've all gone too far and we should row back. Uh, a lot of what I will speak to is based on my experience from a long time ago when I used to work in a central bank. I don't speak on behalf of that central bank, but I think you'll see that it's at least influenced the way I think about this problem. So uh, without further ado, this is what I want to talk about. And I'll start with a brief synopsis of what I said two years ago, because I think it's, it's still relevant today. So I spent most of my time in the central bank thinking about monetary policy. Uh, and this is the way I was taught to think about economic policy. There's a very, very clear structure in our mind. We needed to understand the system first. So we'd have a model of the economy. We'd identify market failures. You write down the model. Out of that model should jump a, a loss function. Uh, which specifies your objectives, your target. Given that model, you would select instruments, uh, you'd know the transmission mechanism of those instruments, and then you take decisions. And that's the way central bankers think about monetary policy. And I think this is the way central bankers are doing macroprudential policy. I think there's a pretty much an understanding we don't have a model. I think when everyone's pushed, no one has a loss function. So instead, what we're doing is we're taking instruments that we think work, we're taking decisions based on an idea that doing nothing is worse than doing something. We're using a model we, have, we think we have in our heads that we're, doing, um, we're not doing harm. We're, do, we're, we're making things better, not worse. But as we go, we're, in, we're implicitly setting the objectives of the regime by precedent. Uh, and I think that's a concern. At least in the long run, that's going to be concern. You can survive doing this for one year. You can survive doing this for five years. I mean, I was thinking about this almost 10 years ago. So we're quite a long way down this road, and I still think we're not very far on these fundamental questions. So what is, what is the ultimate loss function that should be guiding policy? And this starts at the very top with, okay, just what are these high objectives? We often talk about these two things, increasing the resilience of the system and stabilizing the broad provision of financial services and debt stocks and asset prices as though maybe they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. And we should be very clear, again, we, if we're doing the second, if that's part of the overall regime, separate to the first, that's a fundamental difference if we're actually going to do that. But that's just the first step. We need to be clear what do we mean exactly by resilience, by the financial system, by core financial services. Then we need to start setting targets, which is where we get to today. What's the optimal failure rate of the system? That's critical to any, any optimal conduct of policy how, what's the optimal frequency of crises? And that's not even enough either. As we know from monetary policy, it's not enough to know you have an inflation target. You need views about whether inflation above or below your target have, the, have symmetrical losses. So these are fundamental questions, I think, that we need to address. And I, I, don't, I, I see some work now that's starting to address these questions, but I don't think we're very far down that road. And I fear that until these questions have been answered, we can't really claim to be doing optimal policy. We can't even claim to be making things better, not worse. If you don't have objectives, it's very, very hard to answer that question. So to the presentation today, I like the question because it's directly getting at this point, should we have in that loss function house prices? And that's why I think this is the, the, the whole focus of this conference is, is such a good thing. What's my answer? My answer is no, but as I said, at least I like the question. Why this is a, I could have done this chart for any number of countries, I chose the UK. There was a period between the early 90s and 2007 where we were all the central bankers patting ourselves on the back. It was the great stability, it was the great moderation. GDP growth was stable, inflation was low and stable, it was a wonderful thing. In the background, household balance sheets were blowing up, house prices were rising, didn't feel like it was a problem. We may see circumstances like this again, even when we think the financial system is still resilient. And we need to know whether we want to do something about that. But, so here's my, this is why I answer no. I think to answer these questions, you have to start at the beginning. You have to understand the system. You then have to specify broad objectives once you understand, and then you can define and calibrate your target. So, in the, in the macro realm, you'd start off with a macro textbook. 
Do you have a good understanding of business cycle macro? Out of that will drop a price stability objective, and then you go about deciding on a 2% HICP target or whatever else. In the macro prudential realm, I don't think we have a fit for purpose model, G model of the system. So in this context, I think you'd want a model having, which has got multiple banks in it, potentially millions of households and construction companies. You need to, you need to explain the evolution of credit, of house prices, uh, the incidence of distress and default. And by the way, not in a model where you're assuming everyone is rational and everyone's the same. And you can aggregate back to a GE model where you can, you can put an optimizing bank in a DSG model and think you've done macro pru, because I don't think you have. So my, my, my answer is no, because I don't think we've done these preliminary steps yet. And until you've done those, I'd be very nervous about putting in a house price target, because I, I don't know why you're doing it. A little bit on tedious terminology. People use these, use these terms, micro pru, macro pru, interchangeably. We have people here today who notionally work in the area of micro prudential. Uh, and before the crisis, we had this, I guess, very narrow definition of micro pru, that it was focused on an in institution at a time, blind to everything else. So in this case, you'd be protecting individual banks one at a time from the housing market. Macro pru, with the emphasis on the prudential, would be well, once you think you've done that properly, you've protected each individual bank from the housing market, then you start thinking about the interactions. So you're going to protect the whole, the whole banking system from the housing market. And if you're really brave on the prudential front, you start thinking about protecting the whole financial system from the housing market. I think there's a third objective, which is when you start thinking genuinely macro. So this is beyond resilience to the financial system, and you start wanting to protect the housing market from the financial system, the other way around, or the broader economy. I think today we're talking about two and three, and we're specifically talking about residential property prices, but as has been mentioned already, commercial property may be actually much more important in many ways. So what's the prudential angle? Okay, this has been discussed and it's well understood. There are obvious reasons why we would care about the housing market because it's so often bound up in financial crisis. That's a given, we understand this. Uh, but I think the people doing micro pru have also learned a lot of lessons too. Uh, so they know full well that lending 125% LTV is, is not such a great idea and I think they're gonna be hot on that in the future. Uh, they're much more conscious of episodes of, of exuberant lending. Uh, as a matter of course now, in many countries, we force the lenders to actually test affordability at the point of origination. And everyone's doing stress tests these days on mortgage books. So the, there's a big question of what needs to be done. I mentioned the UK in passing here because we had what everyone understood was a very large boom in house prices uh, in the 90s and noughties. And many things went wrong in 2008 in the UK banking system. But the one thing that probably didn't is the little corner over there on the chart on the, on the right, the losses on the UK residential mortgage book were very, very low. There are huge losses everywhere else, but very low there. And that, I think, again, reminds us that house prices, even when you're pretty confident they're growing very fast, are not a, a summary statistic of the threat to resilience. Now, we could have an interesting discussion here about was that because the Bank of England cut rates and did QE so aggressively? And was it because underneath it there was forbearance? Well, maybe. But I think if, if, we're, if we're using house prices on the left as a summary statistic of the threat to resilience, we need to work on that, I think, a little bit. So what's the actual macro prudential? Beyond the resilience of the financial system, are there any other reasons to care about the housing market? I think potentially there are three. Uh, the first is a protecting people from themselves argument, which is even if the banks are okay, even if the economy is okay, when house prices get out of control, there's gonna be a tail of the household distribution that's gonna get into trouble. Uh, and we might wanna try and protect people from themselves. There's a macro argument, which is even if the financial system is okay with boom and bust in the housing market, when you get a bust, the slowdown in aggregate demand is much greater when household debt is high, and we don't want that. So let's lean against that. And there's a, there's a third macro concern on the supply side, which is when house prices run away with themselves, resources get sucked into the, the construction sector, and it's a misallocation of resources, and that's, that's a bad thing. I think all these three things are eminently sensible, but you need to figure out which one you want to do and which ones we're, we're, we collectively are responsible for. These may sound to you like they're hypothetical, abstract, what's the point of this, what's the relevance of this, nobody's doing this. I think the Bank of England did the second of these. A lot of people talk about uh, 
the LTI caps the bank introduced. I don't think, if you listen to what the bank said, they did those primarily because they thought the UK banking system was about to fall over. I think they did this because they thought in a future downturn, if household debt continues to increase, there'll be a very sharp slowdown in consumption. And the Bank of England had just been through a period where it was very hard to stabilize the economy. They had to do a lot of QE, and maybe they don't want to do that next time around. So they talk about this aggregate demand externality from rising house prices. I'm not saying it was a bad idea. I am saying they did it for more than just a pure resilience focus. Uh, King Canute. Uh, this is a, I thought this was the one contribution of this presentation. It turns out somebody else more senior than me had made this point before. King Canute uh, famously uh, took his officials down to the sea and proved to them essentially that he wasn't all powerful. He couldn't hold back the tide. Uh, what's the relevance of this to house prices is don't target something you can't control. I think we all believe that, and we, there's evidence to show, there are levers that central bankers and regulators have at their disposal which they can use to influence house prices. I think very, very few people believe those instruments can be really used to control house prices. Your best hope, I probably would agree with Adam Posen, is, is proper fiscal levers, but even they are going to be hard-pressed to counter big surges in house prices that are driven by these exuberant expectations, either of future prices or income. I mean, there's some research here I quote from the US, which says, you know, roughly a third of the big run-up in US house prices was this big exuberant expectations, animal spirits. I think it's hard to fight this stuff. But the real King Canute problem, I think, with house prices is we don't actually want to do it, I don't think. Certainly, if we're thinking about putting a, the equivalent of a 2% inflation target, so a K% percent house price target, I don't think you want to do that because... There, as we know, there are fundamental drivers of real house prices for all manner of reasons that have been talked about by other people uh, today and yesterday. Changes in long-term risk-free rates, the quantity and quality of the housing stock, demography, expectations of permanent income. By the way, they may be based on fundamentals and you might not want to lean against those. Uh, and obviously the fiscal incentives as well. So there's no reason in my mind to suppose that nominal house prices should grow at K percent or real at K minus two. Uh, if, so if the, if the rest of the economy is stable, if you have no real business cycle or financial cycle, uh, I wouldn't expect house prices necessarily to be growing at a steady rate. Actually, uh, it's not house price inflation anyway. I think really it's how the level of house prices that actually matter. I mean, it's that that's going to matter for things like PD and LGD. So what you would want to do, I guess, in an ideal world is try and strip out all the fundamental movements in house prices concentrate on the froth and try and lean against, lean against that, if you could. But I think the bit, one of the big differences here between inflation targeting and this is, I mean, it's somewhat heretical to say, but 2% inflation target, 3% inflation target, we can probably claim there's a welfare loss and two's better than three, maybe. Uh, but I'd argue maybe the welfare loss is small. I think if you, if you start saying you're gonna target relative pro real prices, and you're going to move them, or move them around, I think the potential welfare losses there, if you move them away from fundamentals, could be potentially much larger. You're going to distort consumption choices and all the rest. I think micro guys will tell you you could, have, you could generate large welfare losses. Still, those losses may be acceptable relative to avoiding crises, but you know, to answer that question again, you need a proper loss function. Uh, and again, this point's been made already, so I don't need to repeat. House prices are not kind of a homogenous problem across countries. You have these big variations, and you'd need to take those into account too. So last but not least, I've got a little bit of time, so I want to talk about some actual practical concerns that I have. Uh, one is accountability. So this regime's in its infancy. I claim, maybe I'll get some pushback, I don't think anyone really understands the system, uh, our capacity to reliably model systemic risk, and we're not really, I think, crystal clear on objectives. And therefore, that's going to make the conduct of policy opaque. I think we can talk about leaning against systemic risk, but it's going to be very hard to be precise when you're talking about that to parliamentarians, what exactly you're doing. But when you tell people you're targeting house prices, everyone, it seems, knows what's happening to house prices. So everyone can monitor that. And my, my grave fear with this is, if we talk about a whole suite of things that macroprudential does, and all but one of them are frankly opaque and invisible, to 99.9% .9 of the population, and one is very visible, that's what you're going to be judged on. 
because everyone can monitor house prices. And then it's the classic trap of rules-based policy when you don't believe the rule. Because you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If house prices are rising and you're convinced there's no problem, you may feel th then the kind of inaction bias may flip around. You're, almost, you're forced to do something you don't want to do. Because how else can you explain the regime? Uh, so my, my, my concern here was, by all means, we should emphasize we again. Over and over, we need to monitor house prices. We need to explain, we need to explain that rising house prices is not an increase in, how, in household wealth. It's a redistribution. I'll come to that in a second. But when we start using words like target, we give people the sense that that is what this regime is for. It's for stabilizing the housing market. Uh, and I think that's a dangerous game to jump into. Uh, last but not least, I think there's a fundamental difference between uh, another one between monetary and macro pru. S simplifying somewhat, monetary policy, you think the Phillips curve is vertical in the long run. If you have an impact on equity, doing monetary policy well is probably the best you can do. You keep people in jobs, you avoid deep recessions. Uh, macro pru to me seems fundamentally different. It's going to be redistributive in many ways. And the housing market is a classic point of that. So rising house prices don't increase household wealth, wealth they redistribute. People at the top of the ladder gain, people who aren't yet on the ladder lose out. So policy interventions which move house prices around are going to be redistributive. Maybe in a good way, but they're going to hurt. And let's not kid ourselves, as we heard already this morning, policymakers are sensitive to this stuff. They're sensitive to people who say, I can't get on the housing ladder. That when, when, someone, when a factory lays off a worker, it's very rare that the boss will say, I've laid you off because Mario Draghi raised interest rates. But it may be much more likely that a bank manager can tell a person who wants a mortgage, I can't lend you, I can't loan money to you because I've been told by the central bank it's imprudent. So people will be sensitive to this stuff. Uh, and equally, you know, on, the, on the other hand, people are, very, people are aware of what the house is worth. And if macroprudential policy is pushing down on house prices, uh, people are going to be sensitive to that and politicians will be sensitive to that. It doesn't mean that policymakers shouldn't do it. But it does mean, I think, that this is a very politically sensitive territory terrain to get into. It's inherently political. So for me, policymakers need a very clear, transparent remit, which they can use every time they speak to the public and parliamentarians. I'm doing this because. Uh, and to me, saying I'm doing this because I have a house price target, I, I can't then justify and rationalize. Uh, I think that's, that's a dangerous game. But more broadly to that, of course, it speaks to I need to have a transparent and clear remit to explain anything I'm doing in this domain. Uh, and saying I'm leaning against systemic risk, I worry, is, is, is insufficient. And at that point, I should just wrap up and stop and say, again, to repeat, this was not someone from the financial sector telling you, go roll all this back. Not at all. What I am saying, though, is I think there's a lot of good work being done in the absence of a clear theoretical framework. And doing something, I think, at the moment, is clearly better than doing nothing. But at some stage, we need to fill in these blanks. We need a clear model of the system, and we need a loss function which is going to guide optimal policy or near optimal policy. And that's me. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Very comprehensive presentation indeed.